All right then, if you have your Bibles with you, we'd ask that you uh, turn to the Gospel of Mark. Mark uh, chapter number 10, and we're going to begin reading in verse 21. A uh, fairly familiar subject tonight, um, Mark chapter 10, and we're going to begin reading in uh, verse 21. Then Jesus, beholding him, loved him, and said unto him, One thing thou lackest, go thy way, sell whatsoever thou hast, and give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven. And come, take up the cross, and follow me. Amen. And he was sad at that, saying, and went away grieved, for he had great possessions. And Jesus looked round about and saith unto his disciples, How hardly shall they that have riches enter into the kingdom of God? And the disciples were astonished at his words. But Jesus answereth again and saith unto them, Children, how hard is it for them that trust in riches to enter into the kingdom of God? It is easier for a camel to go through the eye of a needle than for a rich man to enter into the kingdom of God. And they were astonished, out of measure saying among themselves, Who then can be saved? And Jesus looking upon them, With men it is impossible, but with God, for with God all things are possible. Let's pray. Dear Lord, we thank you and we praise you for your word tonight. Lord, as it lays before us tonight, it seems a little bit more of a treasure knowing that these books are being demolished in the East even as we speak. God, we pray that you'd preserve us, that you'd preserve us a word uh, that we could use one together and speak of the goodness of God. God, we pray for that place tonight that you would uh, uh, stabilize it if it's your will. Uh, that you protect those Christians there, that you cause their lives to be sustained if it's in your will. And Lord, if not, that they may be a testimony even unto death and uh, give praise to you. God, help our church here together, Lord. We pray these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Now, uh, maybe some not so familiar verses of Scripture. When I've heard this preached on myself, most of the time, uh, people use Matthew's accounting of the same events. His language is just a little bit different than Mark's recording. But I, I liked uh, what this said. And what we're going to be uh, preaching about tonight, Lord being our help for, is spiritual salvation. He makes a very, uh, they, they were bewildered and wondered. He said, who then can be saved? Now, one thing, and I, I, I will always believe, Lord, be my help with the very same thing, that God predestines those whom he will. But listen, uh, what I have not seen preached in Sovereign Grace churches is the necessity of salvation. Uh, you know, I really believe this, election is unto salvation, it's not salvation. Uh, if, uh, the Bible says uh, concerning Lydia, he opened her heart. And that event, was Lydia fore, foreordained? Yes, she was. But see, until he saved her, it didn't come to pass. And I believe a lot of people today are almost equating election and redemption as the same thing, and they're not. Uh, they're two different teachings. And so my, my, my question for you tonight simply is this, are you saved? You know, when I was a boy, the uh, Lord saved me in 81. I was a 12-year-old boy, and I think it was, I know it was in June, and I was still excited and glad about it when school started in late August, and I remember telling all my friends I had been saved. And a lot of them understood and knew what I meant. But I remember one girl, and she attended a church. She goes, what does that mean? And then, you know, I didn't think about it then, but years later, and that's been 40 years, she truly didn't know. Right. She really didn't. Uh, and, uh, and, you know, and I, I felt sorry for her. And as the years have gone past, 
<coughs> I even feel more sorry for her because I still don't know if she's been enlightened by the Almighty to know what saved is. Now the word saved in context with redemption, with, with spiritual things, ha, uh, occurs 35 times in your King James Bible, New Testament, the Gospels, and the church letters all together. And if it's mentioned 35 times, I believe it's noteworthy to be preached on. You know, uh, concerning a woman's covering in the New Testament, that's only mentioned once. And we certainly practice and preach and understand that that's the truth. Then being saved is so much more than important, right? Uh, it, it, it deserves double study, if you will, because of the content that the Lord Jesus inspired men to do with this. Now, verse 21, you all know the story. Uh, this rich young ruler comes, and that ruler doesn't mean that it means he... Uh, he had authority over his own wealth. He wasn't like a ruler in the synagogue or anything like that. He, he was a rich man and was in control of his own money. <clears throat> and if you remember, uh, the Lord Jesus repeats the behavioral commandments to him. Thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not lust, and all those were in regarding the behavior not with God. And he said, all these I've kept from my youth. Yeah. Well, he was lying then. And uh, it said the Lord had compassion on him, loved him, and said, sell all that thou hast. Now, the first measure of salvation really is this, what's important to you. Now, the Lord Jesus knew exactly where that man's importance lied. But see, uh, we as the Lord's people, <clears throat> listen, we can be in the very same situation and not have the wealth that this young man has. Uh, it may be a vehicle, it may be your career, it may be, uh, it may be almost anything, but it gets down to this, that what becomes between or what comes before Christ in your relationship? That was the real question. And, uh, and he was trusting in self. Now, we read through all this, we just, we, Excuse me, we just covered all that. Time and time again, the Lord Jesus says it is easier for a camel to go through an eye of the needle than a rich man to get into heaven. Now, the reason why the Lord Jesus says, well, they're trusting in their riches. Now, you think about it this, this evening, most people don't trust just Jesus for salvation. That's why they don't understand grace. And that's why they don't understand that we're just depending on Christ. I was talking to a very good friend of mine at work the other day, and we were talking about church names. And I said, well, I said, of course, we're Baptists, but I said, we probably emphasize baptism less than any other group there is. And he goes, what? I mean, he, he was tore up. And I said, I said, no, I said, we don't think it has any redemptive quality at all. I said, in fact, I said, the reason we're called that is the Catholic Church called us anti-Baptists, that we were against infant baptism. And I said, through the years, they dropped the anti, and we just became Baptists. And he stood marveled. But I want you, I want you to see that that's something too, isn't it? It's not riches, it's not wealth, but I know a lot of people that hang on to it. Mm -hmm. I know a lot of people. Uh, I believe a woman should have long hair. I believe it's biblically correct. But I know a lot of people who hang on to the very same long hair in the wrong way. Mm -hmm. You know what I'm saying? And, and, and so as the, as the Lord is making this statement, He says... They're trusting in the wrong thing. He's trusting in riches. Now he says it is easier for a camel to go through the eye of the needle. Now I've heard all the stories, and <clears throat> I have to say this, I've never been able to verify them by information. You know, Google knows everything, right? And uh, uh, about this being a special gate, and the camels had to be unloaded, and the camel would crawl through this. 
I've not been able to verify that. That that may be just as true as, as, as the sun's coming up in the morning. But have you ever thought about it? Maybe it's just a camel going through an eye. Amen. That's right. You say, well, there's no way. Well, God can get her through there. Mm-hmm. And that's that's about how easy <laughs> it took that much effort and that much grace to get you saved is to get through a real life camel through a thimble, I mean, through the hole of a needle. It just is miraculous. Just as much of a miracle. So I personally believe when he said a camel through the eye of a needle, he's saying exactly like that, a camel through an eye of a sewing needle. And, and, and so we find then, as the Lord's people, that one measure, do you, if you're really saved, where does Christ fit in into your life? Now, I want you to see he ends this. With men, it is impossible. But with God, all Amen. things are possible. Yeah. So we find then that this this salvation that we treasure, number one and first foremost, comes from God. You know what? It seems impossible to take something so filthy and ungodly and, 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 de- and depraved and make them worthy in the sight of God. That's impossible. But with God, all things are possible. And, and that's, what, that's what the story is talking about. And we know the best we understand that this young man was never saved and went back to the world and, and trusted what the world had to offer. And the best that we know, he died in his sins. The Gospel of Luke chapter 13. Luke chapter 13. Uh, beginning in verse 23. Luke 13, verse 23, the Bible says this, Then said one unto him, Lord, are there few that be saved? And he said unto them. Now, I want you to see that question. Are there few that be saved? And the Lord's going to give us a very detailed answer. But let me say this first. Yes, there are few and far between. And you know what? If you believe that you have to hit harder and beg harder to get people saved, that's a great discouragement to you. But if you understand and know that that's simply the mind of God, it makes no sense to us. I don't see nobody going to heal, do you? Uh, I mean, that's beyond fathom for me. But God knows. He certainly got it under his discourse. And so why should we stress? Are there few that be saved? Certainly there are few. Look around. You know, they're they're going head over heels at things that feel good and that look good and that are enticing to the flesh. But we come back here, there are few that are saved. Now that's not Billy Graham running down the aisle, but it's simple gospel truth. And we have to take it for what it is. Verse 24. Strive to enter in at the straight gate. For many, I say unto you, will seek to enter in and shall not be able. Now, the straight gate, the narrow gate, I think is it's what it's called in Matthew's Gospel, the very same text, uh, uh, is a gate that most people never find. Now let me say this in case I forget to for the rest of the service. That gate is the person of the Lord Jesus Christ. That gate, that opening was completely finished when he rose again from the belly of the earth. That is when the redemption for us was complete. That's when it happened and Praise be his name, because if it, not, if it had not been for his goodness and mercy and his, and his obedience to that, there would be no salvation to be had. Verse 25. Uh, <clears throat> when once the master of the house is risen up and has shut to the door, and ye began to stand without and to knock at the door, saying, Lord, Lord, open unto us. And he shall answer and say to you, I know not whence ye are. Now I think it's very, uh, very interesting because he says he's going to shut the door. 
You know what that means? One day the time will elapse. And it will be done. I personally think that that will be the second coming of Christ. I don't know that. You know what? Uh, because of his goodness and grace, he might save the last elect and then place him in one of the Lord's churches before we take another here. I, I don't know the mind of God. But I certainly, I, I certainly understand this, that there'll be one day when they're starting to do this. And notice what his response was. He didn't, he didn't say, go away. He said, I don't even know you. You know who gets in? The ones that he knows, the ones that he loves, the ones that draw him to himself. You know, I've heard, and I know you've had little children's book, uh, the, the Noah flood and people uh, banging and beating to get in. I don't believe a word of that. Uh, you, you know what? They were very well satisfied in their sin. And even after Noah and his, and his family got in there, there was a week they laughed and jeered at him. You think they were... You think they were jumping and trying to get in there? I don't. Yeah, you know why? Because they were damned before eternity began. I, I don't think they had any interest at all. And, and, and so we find that in that, that he says, I don't know you. Verse 26, then shall they begin to say, we have eaten and drunk in thy presence, and thou hast taught in our streets. But he shall say, I tell you, I know not whence you are. Depart from me, all you workers of iniquity. Now, I want you to notice two things. They said, wait a minute, we were there with you. You know, everybody that's come through and passed in and out of New Testament Baptist Church, I don't believe they're saved, do you? You think in that day they'll say, you know what? I heard Brother Larry preach at New Testament numerous times. I was there. We had, we had a meal in the basement. I observed the Lord's Supper with those people. And just like it's told in the book of Revelation chapter 20, they'll say, apart from me, you work for the iniquity. I never knew you. Amen. You know, so that means there's fakes out there, right? There's a few that's true blue. And there's lots and lots of fakes. And so we, uh, and you know what? It's not our determination, it's not our position to determine that. That's in the hands of the Almighty. Now, if you watch them long enough, you know what? That tree had good peaches on it this year, didn't it? Because it's a good peach tree. Hadn't, hadn't spawned any apples. We hadn't. We have put no we have put no cars off of it because it's a peach tree. Right? And it, a peach tree puts out peaches in the very same way, godly people, people that are redeemed, they love the things of God. And so he says, uh, I don't know you. I don't you, you may have attended, but I don't know you. There will be weeping and gnashing of teeth when you see Abraham and Isaac and Jacob and all the prophets in the kingdom of God, and you yourselves are thrust out. Now, I want you to see he, he lists some of the patriarchs of Israel that certainly were saved individuals, and he says, but you're going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. And I want you to say, it, it does not mention hell or the lake of fire in this context. It just says there's going to be weeping and gnashing of teeth. Now, the reason the Lord Jesus Christ said it that way, it was a term the Jews knew about. They would go to the wailing wall yeah. and they would weep and they would grind their teeth. And I don't, I don't like to grind my teeth. I do without knowing it sometimes. And it causes my teeth to hurt. But all of us here are family tonight. You know, I've heard Joey grind his teeth. That's what they're talking about. It, it's an expression of misery. It, it's an expression of heartache. But you know what? He didn't even acknowledge him. He said, I don't even know who you are. You know, so I guess the thing that we need to understand and know are you saved or are you not? Because th th this is the end result. Christ the Lord Jesus Christ, he certainly knows. He understands. He, he, uh, he already has uh, exactly the situ your situation before his hand. The Gospel of John, uh, very familiar verses of Scripture. We're going to read the familiar one. 
And then we're going to read one that's not as familiar. Uh, uh, all the uh, people, all the little children in the world, the United States used to co could quote John 3.16. The Lord Jesus Christ addressing a spiritual man named Nicodemus. Uh, he had told Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. And so if you ever wonder why that phraseology the Lord Jesus used, this is the only time in the King James Bible that that is said like that. Did you, did you know that? It, it's never repeated in that way again. Now, the reason why, uh, and Nicodemus even brought it up. How are you going to be born again? Mom is gone. Can she birth me a second time? Is that not impossible with man? He was giving Nicodemus an impossibility and said it has to be this way. It has to be outside your realm. It has to be outside your religion. It has to be out, outside realistic possibilities, Nicodemus. You must be born again. Uh, uh, you must have the energy of someone else to be born in a spiritual way, just the energy, like the energy of your mother to be born the first time. Nicodemus, you've got to be born again. Verse 16, for God so loved the world, the world of believers, the world of his people whom he created. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believeth on him should not uh, perish but have everlasting life. And you know what? That's a wonderful, wonderful truth. If you're lost here tonight, listen to me carefully. Those are true words of God, and He's still in the saving business. The question is, do you believe with Him? Do you believe in Him in a spiritual sense? Do you, do you, do you know who He is with the knowledge that passes this up here and comes right down here? Do you know Him intimately? That's still true. We, as Sovereign Grace folks, we don't need to give up preaching you must be born again. And yeah. we don't need to give up in you believe in Christ. Uh, we don't need, to, we need, don't need to let that go because it's very true. Now, notice verse 17. The Bible says this. For God sent not, not His Son into the world to condemn the world. Now, why wasn't that Christ ministry? The law did that for them. That was the ministry of the law. They were condemned already. Listen, dear friend, tonight, if you're lost, you're condemned already. Mm -hmm. uh, I don't have to do that for you. Nobody else has to do that for you. You're as good as dead. You're condemned already. And so that's why Christ didn't have that ministry. But that the world, through Him might be saved. Now what did we talk about how impossible it was for a big old pump back Campbell to go through a needle? They had to go through the eye of the needle. And you will get to glory through Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing, just like going through an eye of the needle. That's the very same way. Say, Larry, that's impossible. No, <laughs> With men, it's very impossible. Yeah. But with God, all things are possible. I point you to Him tonight. He is the only one that will save you. He is the only one that has any real compassion on you. He, he is the only one that has the remedy for what, what is ailing you tonight. He is the answer to everything. And He made that amply, amply clear. We've got to go literally through him like you're going to go through that back door in just a little bit. Acts chapter 2. Acts chapter 2. Verse 21. Acts chapter 2 and verse 21. The Bible says this, And it shall come to pass, that whosoever shall call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. Very simplistic, isn't it? Now, we're not going to read the whole context. I know the context of the verse. I'll give you that. Peter was preaching to the Jews. Mm -hmm. 
And he says, you just believe. Very, very simple word, isn't it? Now, again, the Lord God is asking you to believe the impossible. That there was a man that was born of a virgin woman, lived 33 and a half years in this place, the very living Son of God, sin never entered his mind. That is impossible for me to get a hold of sometime, and yeah. because I know how wretched and filthy and ungodly really that I am. Mm -hmm. But he did it because he was God. And so he says, all you have to do is believe that. Do you believe how holy he was? Do you believe how righteous he was? You know what? If you believe that, you'll be enticed to Christ. You'll, you'll fall in love with him. You'll, you'll be attracted to him. You, you know, when people have no interest in uh, coming to church or being near unto Christ, listen, I, I, I wonder about that. Because, you know, at the end of the day, I want to go home because I know Donna's going to be there. I know my girls are going to be there. This evening, uh, little AJ's birthday, I want to be with him. You know why? Because I love him. And people that, that, that don't think that way, listen, I put a big question mark on their redemption. I really do. And so we find that Peter made it very simple for them. You've got to believe Acts chapter 4. Uh, Acts chapter 4, beginning in verse 10. Uh, Acts chapter 4 and verse 10, the Bible says this, Be it known unto you all, this is Peter at the temple, Be it known unto you all and to all the people of Israel that the, by the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth, whom ye crucified, whom God raised from the dead, even by him doth this man stand here before you whole. So, how did the, the, the man's legs get restored? Through Christ. By the name of Jesus Christ. Through Him. Verse 11, this is the stone, meaning Christ. This is the stone which was set at naught of you builders, which has become the head of the corner. Neither is there salvation in any other, for there is another, none other name under heaven which a, what, heaven given among men whereby you must be saved. Amen. So where does it come? It comes from the Lord Jesus Christ. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Uh, you know what? I love the teachings of grace. But on the very same note, grace would be empty without Christ. There would be no answer to the penalty of sin without Christ's blood. Right. Do we deserve it? Certainly not. That, that's the grace part. But grace would be empty without Christ. And so do you trust Him or do you not? Do you love Him or you, are, are you driven to Him or are you driven from Him? That, that is the real question that, that we must ask each, uh, of ourselves tonight, each and every one of us. And do we really know Him? Romans chapter 5. Now don't 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 hold on to you too hard. I'm not going to run you down the Romans road. Uh, Romans chapter five, but I do want to take some stuff that are no, that is noteworthy here. Romans chapter five and verse nine, the Bible says this: much more being now justified by His blood. Plus nothing, minus nothing. Again, if it hadn't been for the blood, grace would be empty. But blessed be the name of the Lord. He fulfilled the office of a sacrifice and made grace a living thing, something miraculous and glorious. Much more than being now justified the blood by His blood, we shall be saved from wrath. Again, there's our word. Through Him. Just like going through the gate, just going through the narrow spot, that's how uh, we are saved is through Christ Jesus. If you're depending on any other thing, some kind of experience, some kind of little magical prayer, listen, get it up, dear friend, tonight and understand and know it's plus Jesus. <laughs> it's Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing, Jesus and His 
full atonement. It's so simple, is it not? And you know, you know why it seems so simple to me? Because I've been saved for 40 plus years. And he gave me a heartfelt understanding of it. And I pray that each, each and every one of you tonight will have that understanding and that, that treasure that he's given me because that's something that when everything else is breaking loose that you can hang on to. Verse 10, For if when we were enemies we were reconciled to God by the death of his Son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life, by his sinlessness, by him living here this 33 and a half years with a pureness about him like there's never been before. Through that are we saved. Through the person of Christ, nothing more, nothing less. It must be completely through him. Uh, Romans chapter 10. Romans chapter 10, verse 9. Romans chapter 10 and verse 9. The Bible says this, If thou shalt confess with thy mouth the Lord Jesus Christ, and shalt believe in thine heart that God hath raised him from the dead, thou shalt be saved. Thou still believe that, don't you? It doesn't make me an Armenian. It doesn't make me that I, that I lessen the experience of grace, but it does say this, Believe in thy heart. That, that's the very same word for soul. It doesn't mean believe in cognition. It means to believe with the spiritual man. Verse 10. For with the heart, the spiritual man, the soul, with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. So if you don't have the heart righteousness first, that confession, that saying, I know Jesus will mean nothing to you. Verse 11, for the scripture saith, whosoever believeth on him shall not be ashamed. You ever wonder why you do things and you might, you know, I probably should tell them about the Lord. I uh, might ever tell them why that's wrong. And you kind of shy away from it. Well, uh, don't be ashamed of it. Verse, four, uh, verse 12, For there is no difference between the Jew and the Greek, for the same Lord over all is, in, is rich unto all them that call upon him. For whosoever shall call upon the name of the Lord shall be saved. That is a very, very true verse. We do not need to it, it throw that out with the bathwater. But notice verse 14. How then... Shall they call on him in whom they have not believed? Now, if I didn't believe this platform would hold me up, I wouldn't have got up here. Do you believe you're that steadfast in Jesus? No matter what vile thing I've done, I believe Jesus is sufficient. And there's been some things I'm pretty ashamed of. But no matter what I've done, he covers it. It's done because of his sacrifice. It's in the blood. So they can't they can't believe that they if they never heard what the gospel's about. How shall they believe in whom they have not heard? And how shall they hear without a preacher? You know, uh, I love gospel music, but it's not a preacher. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, I love to study this book. I love a classroom setting, but it's not preaching. A preached word is a living word. It's one that, it's what drives it home. It's what makes it real. And, and apparently, if I understand this to the Romans, like I, like I believe I do, it has to be that way. You ever wonder why he told the Roman church that? Because it wasn't going to be too long that they would take the Lord's Supper and turn it into a sacrament. Uh, that is not what the Lord's Supper is. They were going to take baptism and say, this is redemption. Mm -hmm. And you know what? Paul saw it coming. He did. And, and, and so we as the Lord's people need to understand and know that it's plus Jesus, 
It, it, it's <laughs> Jesus plus nothing, minus nothing, Jesus and Jesus alone. Last place, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 18. For the preaching of the cross. You ever wondered, and you know I've heard of some sovereign graces, uh, they don't even want the old rugged cross in their hymnal. They think it's idolatry. Uh, I personally think that's foolishness myself. Because see, the Christ, uh, the cross, was the chosen method that God chose before the foundation of the earth to, to present the sacrifice. So, cursed is the man that hangeth from the tree, Psalms 22. That's a long time before Christ came, wasn't it? And, and, and so we see in this that huh, that redemptive work is everything. It had to have happened that way. For the preaching of the cross to them that perish foolishness. You, you think about that. Just say you go out to your best friend. You can throw whatever other group you want to in that and say, I'm preaching to you, and this is how Paul put it to another church. It's Jesus and Him crucified. That's all I'm preaching. Yeah. They say, well, what else are you going to put with that? What about baptism? What about hooking up with the church? Aren't you, aren't you leaving out works? Which one are you going to do? Well, the Bible says in Corinth, in Corinth had a had a mess going on down there. They had some of the most vile sin that I that I can see from the. Now I've seen some pretty bad stuff in the Lord's churches today, but in in our outline uh, of the churches of that time, it's probably one of the worst ones formerly that you could have. For the preaching of of the cross to them that perish, they're, 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 they are not saved foolishness, but unto us which are saved. It is the power of God. That's why I can rest easy at night. You ever thought about, and, and again, <laughs> I understand a portion of it. But you know what? What's more important to me that I have, more important than having valid baptism is to know that I'm saved. And, and, you know, I think it's interesting to look where church comes from. But you know what? It's just like with genealogy getting you back to Adam. It ain't never going to happen. This church, five churches back, White's Creek Baptist Church over in Muhlenberg County, Kentucky. They came here in 1801, across from Virginia. Four women and one man with letters that dismissed them from other churches, all different churches. So were they a church or not? I believe they were, don't you? I don't think that's self-constitution, do you? I think that, that they came with the intent and understanding that when they got there, they were, they, they were going to unite as a work. And so if that's wrong, just say it is, like, you know, they didn't get their votes and all that. That makes our baptism, that makes our church invalid, does it not? That's what they believe, right? Church of Bumpus Mills, I was baptized under the authority of the Bumpus Mills Baptist Church. Came out of Pew Flat, I've heard two stories. One that they got authority, and one they wouldn't give it authority if they wanted to. I don't know which one is true, I really don't. Uh, but I do know that it's a good sound church, right? So, at the end of the day, and I'm not diminishing church membership. It's, it's very important to a young believer, and it's very important if you want to grow in grace. But at the same token, at the end of the day, I want to know that this old boy knows the Lord Jesus Christ. And that's all I need to know. That's all I need to know.